one thing I've learned. Okay, maybe two or three things. <laughs> I've learned I need to wear hats. Because you see, lots of times I cut my hair off and it gets all messed up and then it just looks horrible, doesn't it? So I wear hats. hats I feel a little more comfortable and a little bit less self-conscious because people don't usually realize it but I used to be quite shy you know and kind of peaceable and intimidated by a lot of things maybe not intimidated but okay maybe intimidated I was a shy kind of guy I know that's hard to believe <laughs> look at me now if you could see me now, you know, like, what was that track star? But the point is, yes, I was shy. And God took me and made me into someone different than what I used to be. And he saw me like nobody else saw me and knew me and created in me a clean heart, but then also changed me in such a way that I wasn't afraid of the things that I used to be afraid of. I wasn't terrified by the terrors at night. I wasn't afraid of the opinions of men and women. Now, let's be honest for a minute. I finally got over it at about 50. <laughs> it took me a little while to catch up, you know. I don't claim to be the brightest kid on the block or the fastest learner. Matter of fact, there are times that I was probably downright dumb. Or maybe I should say stubborn. But I think God honored that because he used that stubbornness in ways that caused me to hang on to the things that I believed in from the beginning. The things that I had heard, the things that I'd been taught, the things that I knew to be true. Like, you know, some of those things that other people can get away with doing. You know, shooting their enemies and killing people and doing all kinds of wonderful things that I frankly haven't a clue how they can do it. I don't even claim to understand it. Matter of fact, I don't even bother to try to figure it out. I just tell them, hey, if God told you to kill that person, then I guess God told you to do it. And you know, our society today likes to tell God what to do. Society likes to say, well, we have to take care of business, Lord, so we make these rules and regulations so that we can govern ourselves because you're not doing such a good job. Well, we don't say it that way, but we imply it. We got to do something. Have you ever heard that expression? We got to do something. It only takes good men to remain silent for evil to flourish. Have you ever heard that one? Did you know that that's bull-loney? That's not the word I would have used. You see, I understand having quotes. I like to quote Jesus. I understand people that make up these neat expressions of like, oh, all it takes for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. So they look at a person who might be praying or interceding and say they're doing nothing. They might look at a nation that might have been in prayer and say, oh, they're doing nothing. Me, I don't like to say things that aren't scriptural. I personally don't like to do things that aren't found in the Bible, although just about everything found in the Bible, for good, for bad, for otherwise. But I really don't like a lot of these expressions that people come up with, you know, penny saved, penny earned, or whatever it may be, and then try to pass it off or pawn it off on you as though it were some inspired, spoken word from God. Just because maybe somebody famous said it, and it sounded good, it looked good, it felt good, but was it really good? You see, when you say something like, 
all it takes for evil to flourish, if you're a good man to do nothing, I, I gotta take exception with that. You see, evil may flourish for a season, but in the end, God wins. Evil may flourish for 400 years, but in the end, God wins. Evil may be about a thousand years lying in wait, but in the end, God wins. So I don't really buy sometimes some of the expressions that you know I hear people say and they get all worked up about and say, oh, we've got to get involved because if we don't do something, all we need to do is leave it alone and evil will flourish. Jesus say that? It seems to me that every time I look at what Jesus said, he was telling me about the way life is. He was telling me about the way the world is. He was telling me the way that man acts towards man and the way that man acts towards God. I kind of get the hint that maybe he knew what he was talking about. Kind of because almost every situation that he was in, he seemed to get to the heart of the matter and not the surface, phony issues that supposedly are so important to take care of. I like to talk to people that way. You know, I don't like to talk about some surface issue, you know, like somebody will tell me, well, you know, we got to vote for, you know, the Mormon candidate because we don't like the Christian candidate. And since we don't agree with the Christian candidate, we got to get him out of office. So we got to vote for the Mormon candidate. And I look at him and say, really, what did God tell you to do? Oh, well, well, now wait a minute, don't get God involved in politics, you know, no, 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 you know, we can't do that because, you know, we don't like the pick God chose in the first place. Oh, so you don't like the man God put in office, so now to get the man that God put in office out of there, you're going to put another man that you want in office because you don't like the man that God put in office because you don't like what you might be learning about yourselves because he's in office? You see, I look at whoever's in office and I look at the reactions of the people. Here's the people. Here's the man. Do the people make sense? No. Did the man make sense? No. Well, if neither one of them make any sense at all, then what is God trying to tell me by both of the parties playing games with governing themselves? It kind of tells me that man doesn't know what he's doing, but God does. You see, when I read the scriptures, I heard trust in man with all your understanding and, you know, make sure that you understand it all the way, because in all your ways, do it your way, and you'll have it your way, because I did it my way. You know, that's proverbial, you know, 3, 5, and 6, according to man, because, after all, man has to trust in himself. He's got his guns, he's got his mind, He's got his intellect, he's got his experience, he's got his reasoning, he's got his precedent, he's got his law, he's got his reasons, and he's got his abilities. So, of course, God knows man the way he is, so he says, trust in man with everything you got. Throw behind man with whatever you're doing, you know, and however you do it, just make sure you're following man, because in the end, you'll be with man. I love that expression, the self-made man always makes me fascinated by self-made man. God didn't have anything to do with it. God didn't bless him. He's self-made. So I'm always interested in self-made men. Especially when people try to give me these heroes and they say, look at how wonderful they were. Our Christian fathers. And I kind of look at their lives and I go, uh, I wouldn't put them up on a pedestal too high because, you know, they're the Christianity was good, but it wasn't great. You know, kind of like David. David kind of blew it too, you know. No, you can't say that. Why, just because some of our forefathers had slaves. Oh, so how the slaves feel about that? Christian nation? Well, that don't count. Ah, I gotcha. Okay, it only works in some ways. We were a Christian nation, even though we, you know, about killed ourselves over the whole aspect of taxes and money and manipulation, you know, between the North and the South, and then finally 
throwing in slavery too to try to get you know people fighting together so that they could hold the nation together for whatever reason they're sticking together right okay and so we see in politics today people doing the same thing they're trying to tell you to be practical you know you gotta be practical about it Michael you gotta look at it from you know the big picture if you don't vote you get what you didn't vote for yeah God's will well no 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 you don't get it you gotta do what God tells you to do yeah I know I am but God wouldn't tell you not to vote because that's your civic duty I see it's my civic duty to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar you know vote because after all Caesar gave every citizen the ability to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and God said do that so when you make it a law that I have to vote maybe I would but then I wouldn't call it representation I'd call it what indoctrination so I see when people tell me to do something I want to step back I want to take a long step back I want to take a long hard look at what are they saying What are they doing? What exactly are they trying to force me into believing? Whenever I hear people tell me, especially that I have to be not so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good, I always throw back at them, I want to be so heavenly minded that I'm all earthly good. Because without me being heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good to anyone, because after all, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and I'm not looking at man to accomplish that for me. As a matter of fact, I'm not looking at man to make himself into anything except for what he is. Corrupt, no good, evil, and every chance he gets, he's going to blow it. So what I want to do is I want to understand how I can help man to not blow it. I want to understand how I could change the heart of man to see the reality of who he is, evil that he is, and that it doesn't matter whether he remains silent or he opens his mouth and proves how evil he is, that the answers to what's wrong with man is not in man. The answers to what's wrong with society is not in society. The answers are never found within our own intelligent reasoning because we will always rationalize our own ideas into thinking we're right until someone comes along and proves we're wrong and the reality is Jesus did that he proved in no uncertain terms that you can't stack up anything that man has invented or man has thought of against the reality of truth that Jesus said Jesus took the very smartest most intelligent statements that man had come up with to that day and he said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you. And he contradicted it. Didn't he? Oh no, he was contradicting the ceremonial law. You see how people start to compromise? Oh, the ceremonial law. So Jesus said, but I say unto you about the ceremonial law, you've heard it said. No. He spoke direct. And everyone knew what he said. They had no problem with it because... The people that were poor enough and dumb enough and not educated enough knew exactly what he was talking about. Because they could look over at the educated people and the educated people were squirming. Ugh, he doesn't want us to like, you know, love the sinners and you know love the or hate this hate the sin and love the sinners so that way I could still hate them and just make sure that I kind of qualify it by adding that little expression at the end of it. Hate the sinner or hate the sin but love the sinner. Right. So what are you doing about that when you say that you hate the sin and love the sinner? Well, I ban people from coming into my building or church, you know, and I, I make sure that I don't associate with them, you know, and I keep them far away, you know, so that I don't have to talk to them, and I sure don't have to see them because they know where I stand on it. I hate their sin, so I'm not going to deal with them or let them in. I'm going to keep them far away. That way they don't contaminate me. Right. And these are the practical realities of Christianity today. This is what practical Christianity is telling us. Take up your guns, 
defend yourself. Pick up your rights and assert yourself. Pick up your privileges and exhort yourself to be taking back and making a stand against those for whom the gospel is being preached to. You are required by modern Christianity to take a stand and to fight for the faith. But God never said to. He said the battle is within. God himself spoke directly to each individual Christian and said, look, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. That's stupid. Why would you wrestle against someone who's no better than you are and no worse than you are? You're all sinners and you've fallen short of the glory of God. None of you can reach up into heaven and pull yourself up. None of you can reach down into hell and grasp a hold and live there. If you can't even add one single hair to your head, then how in the world can you plan for tomorrow, much less tell me what is going to occur when it comes to the realities of trying to govern yourself and you don't even know what's in the heart of man and how evil it really is. Because Jesus knew the heart of man, he knew what was in the heart of man, he didn't go with anything that man planned. He was all heavenly minded and he was no earthly good. Because Jesus said, don't call anyone good except your Father which is in heaven. For there is no good and no one good except your Father which is in heaven. That's the reality of going with your utmost for his highest. You're not seeking to be like half, pardon the expression, but I'm going to say it anyways because it's the only way to sometimes get people's attention. But there's no such thing as being a half-assed Christian. You either get fully hanging out, or cover it all up. Put on a burqa, a complete robe, and drown out that light that you are. Because one way or another, you're shining bright. And whether you know it or not, everyone is looking at you to see if you have the answers, or if you're just compromised enough to be a hypocrite in Christianity. You see, Christianity is all about being so heavenly minded, you're all Father's honor. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke 135. If the Son of God is born into my mortal flesh, is his holy innocence and simplicity and oneness with the Father getting a chance to manifest itself in me? Is he able to be my innocence and am I innocent now in thinking or am I guilty of charge? Am I becoming simpler of thought and becoming more simplistic, or am I being complicated and making matters worse? Am I becoming one with the Father, or am I becoming farther away from God than I've ever dreamed imaginable? And so I constantly cry out to God, help me, deliver me, forgive me. What was true of the Virgin Mary in the historic introduction of God's Son into this earth is true in every saint. The Son of God is born into me by the direct act of God. God said it, God did it, God has birthed His Son in me. Then I, as a child of God, have to exercise the right of a child, the right of being always face to face with my Father. Are you ready to deal with God on a one-to-one -one basis? Because if you're not, then let me put it bluntly. Go back to Sunday school, which is what church is on Sunday. The majority of evangelical Christianity, or whatever you want to call Christianity, almost all of Christianity on a Sunday morning is Sunday school. It's just a bunch of kids getting together to get their worship in and get their word in and to get out. You get in, you get what you want, you get what you need, and you get out. That's the bottom line. If you were there any other day besides Sunday, I wouldn't say it. But if you're only there on a Sunday, you're just playing Sunday school. And to put it bluntly, Sunday school is for children. And so, if you're not ready to deal with God face to face, then you are literally still in Sunday school. And you're doing your church thing, which is good. But you're still a child. And you need to grow up and go through the lessons and learn the scriptures so that you can 
grow out of the Sunday school stage and become a teacher or a preacher or a leader of some type or a minister or a missionary. But don't tell me that you know a football star is a calling of God. That's a vocation. You should have an avocation besides that. Don't tell me that some rock star in Christian music is, you know, ooh, that's his ministry from the Lord. No, it's not. It's his ability that God has given him to do, and he's used it for gain. Don't tell me that the gifts of the Spirit are used when it's listed as prophets and prophets and teachers and elders and deacons and all those things that are needed for the edifying of the body of Christ and then come back and tell me, well, you know, my church account, you know, is gifted in numbers. So that's one of the gifts of the Spirit. So we, you know, use that and pay them and some of that. Take care of our budget. No. That person who literally is doing the work in the church for monetary reasons still should be a teacher, a preacher, a missionary, or whatever it may be. Because you see, we all have a calling from God. And that doesn't mean it's one of those things that you can see everybody on Sunday morning playing with and trying to make perfect their gift or ability. No, those are things where people are still playing in the sandbox. The reality is when you stand face to face before God and you ask Him, what do you want me to do? That's a scary thought. Because you see, Abraham was challenged with that. What do you want me to do? And God said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, to the place that I'll show you and offer him up as a sacrifice. Are you willing to deal with God face to face? Because the answer is no, you're not. If you're an American Christian, I challenge you right before Almighty God, bluntly. Because if we didn't come out of the 60s, where we used to be idealistic and now we're more pessimistic and put it bluntly, compromising, then we were idealistic in those days. But the bottom line is, when you deal with the holy living God, like Jesus did, one to one with the Father, face to face with God the Father, who gave his only begotten Son, is he really going to let you slide? Are you really going to slip slide your way into the kingdom of heaven without any sacrifice at all? Without any cost? without any uncomfortableness. You're just going to smooth sailing. It's just smooth sailing all the way. You really think so? You're blind. Because that's not true. Jesus said that with much tribulation we shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. With much consternation we would go through challenges that would question our faith and put us right where the rubber meets the road of Will you do what Jesus said to do? Will you follow God like he asks you to do? Will you give up your child, O woman of God, for God? Would you take the knife and offer up your child? Oh, no, that's like a worship. No kidding. God challenged Abraham. And Abraham responded. And God said, now I know you love me. And Abraham is listed as the father of our faith, not because of the things he lived or did, but because of the moment where he was willing to give up all for God. Where are you at on that? What are you doing with your all? Or are you just still in Sunday school? Because the majority of people who come to me and tell me that they want to give their utmost to God for His highest, fail within one week of living up to that challenge that they place before themselves. Because they can't bear the price. They can't count the cost. They don't realize it's not about going for a job interview and interviewing to be pastor of some mega ministry or getting some talent you've got and then deciding to become a worship leader so now you're serving God. No, it's about God challenging you where you're living. In your everyday world where you say practically that you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. You want to play the practical game when God says, no, this has eternal consequences. You are mine or you're not. What are you when it comes to dealing with God face to face? You don't want to meet God on that reality. Because the facts are 
that will always be where you know you are either 100% or you're just working on the 99. And the truth is, many are called, but few are chosen. And except that God chooses us, we can't go that extra 1%. We can go up to the point where we think we can make it, but we'll fall short every single time because God will confront us with our idol, our favorite child, our favorite movie, our favorite whatever it may be, that on the altar of sacrifice when God says, Do you love me? Then take now thy son, thy only son, take now whatever it is and offer it to me. Now, Abraham got back his son, but Abraham was never again to say, No, no, no. Narrow it down to your individual circumstances. Are you so identified with the Lord's life that you are simply a child of God, saved by grace, continually talking to Him and realizing that all things come from His hands? You have earned nothing on your own. It has either come from God and you're giving it back to God, or you're deceiving yourself. Are the graces of His ministering life working out through you in your home? in your business, in your domestic circle? Have you been wondering why you are going through the things you are? Is it not that you have come? Is it not that you have to go through them? It is because of the relationship into which the Son of God has come in His Father's providence in your particular sanctuary. Let Him have His way and keep in perfect union with Him. I recently listened to some of the things that, you know, the President of Chick-fil-A said, you know, the big controversies that came up about it, you know, and the big problems back and forth about the people that quote unquote support or don't support, you know, the issues that supposedly were important. I only wanted to know one issue that I really still would like to know. And I'd ask the man himself personally, like I would ask uh, or like I did ask Rick Warren, but then other people too, like um the big popular people that are out there trying to figure this thing. Uh, I can see it. Glenn Beck, do you know Jesus? And the truth is, no, he doesn't. Then I don't want to have anything to do with him. I'll pray for him. I'll look at what he's saying, but I won't believe it. Because until a man becomes born again, he has no clue what's going on in the world. Until a man actually goes beyond being born again and becomes a child of God, they have no clue what's in store for them. Until a man grows up from being a child of God to becoming a man of God, they have no idea what God will require of them. And until that man of God meets God face to face, they have no idea who they're dealing with or what they're dealing with. Until the reality of Abraham's sacrifice, what in Jewish culture we call it Akeda or the Akidah, the binding of the sacrifice of Isaac, where Abraham, an old man, took Isaac, a young man, probably in his 20s, and Isaac willingly allowed the old man to tie him up. And Abraham was seeing his beloved son as dead before his eyes. That's a man of God. Are you sure you're willing to give your utmost for his highest? Are you confident? that your wife might be on the chopping block. That your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth marriage just might be the one that God tells you to give up even though you've already been divorced. Are you so in love with Jesus that you're willing to tell me sitting down and counting the cost that you want to follow God's only Son, even if you're the only one? You see, the fanatics are. The wackos are willing. The weirdos really are pretty much the example of our faith. Because that's where God meets us face to face. Now you can tell yourself, as I know most Christians have, God will not do anything He hasn't recorded in Scripture for us to do. And I always go back to them, yeah. 
like Abraham. And I get silence. I get complete silence from people, although sometimes somebody smart aleck will try to come back at me and tell me, well, no, because he knew that you know his son was going to live, so he wasn't really going to sacrifice him. He already knew. No, he didn't. It wouldn't have been an offering if he knew. He trusted God for whatever God would do. But he didn't know whether he was going to get his son. He only knew that God could raise him for the death he needed to or whatever he wanted to do. God could do anything he wants to do. And that's where you need to realize why people that say things like, don't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, are wrong. Because God can do anything he wants to at any moment he wants to. And he can interrupt your free will. You betcha. At any point in time, the creator of the universe can terminate it. And everything will be fulfilled. Maybe not in your understanding, but in his. So, it's a scary thing when you start limiting what God can do, and then you start creating your own image of what you think God is. Because once you've met him face to face, as we are told you can, because that's what the life of Jesus being formed in us is. Jesus came that they might know me and know him who sent me. That's what Jesus said. He told his disciples that. I pray that you may be one as I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That you would see the Father. Now, did they all reach that capability? I don't know. John did, obviously. Paul did, obviously. Peter did, presumptuously. <laughs> but what about you? What about you? Have you counted the cost? Are you willing to pay the price? It will cost you your life and everything about your life. Are you willing to pay the price to follow Jesus Christ until the day of your death? Which will be soon. And don't think that just the rapture is going to give you an escape plan. Because what if God says, I want you to go into tribulation. What if God says to you, I want you to go into the great tribulation? What if God says, I want you to overcome the great tribulation by the word of your testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and loving not your life even unto death? What if God says something like that to you when you've been talking to him? face to face.